Good morning everybody and welcome to the March edition of the Gene Shanks Pathological Society sponsored Pathology Grand Rounds Lecture sponsored by the Gene Shanks Foundation and the Pathological Society. Can I remind audience members that we do encourage you to ask questions of the speaker and the way to do this is to click on the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and to type in your questions into the box and I will read out those questions at the end of this morning's lecture. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Tom Jakes. Uh, Tom is the Professor of Paediatric Neuropathology at the University College London Great Ormond Street Institute of Child Health and the Clinical Lead and Laboratory Director for the Department of Histopathology at Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children. He runs a research programme focused on paediatric brain tumours and epilepsy. He is a member of C Impact Now, the consortium to inform molecular and practical approaches to CNS tumour taxonomy and he was the national lead for the childhood solid tumour domain of the Genomics England Clinical Interpretation Partnership. And today Tom will giving us a lecture entitled The Cell Biology of Developmental Tumours, Evidence from Childhood Brain Tumours. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Tom. I'd like to thank you very much indeed, Tom, for agreeing to speak to us this morning. Over to you, Tom. Thank you, uh, Mark. Um, hopefully my screen's sharing there. Yeah, that looks good. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much, Mark, for asking me uh, to, to speak at this Grand Round. It's, it's a great honour. Um, I think... When I was putting this together, there are two themes I wanted to bring out that I, I hope would be interesting to the to the breadth of uh, audience around paediatric brain tumours. One is some of the diagnostic issues and how we've addressed that, which I hope are generalizable to other um, uh, rare disease entities. And the second is a shift in thinking about brain tumours in children, not just around the immediate oncological crisis when they're diagnosed, but as I'll show you as a chronic disease and that the biology and the diagnosis and the management is much more of an uh, akin uh, uh, to non-neoplastic uh, chronic disease. So to give some context, cancer is the leading cause of death in children. This is data from the College of Pediatrics and Child Health showing causes of death um, in children uh, between the ages of one and nine. And you can see that cancer is the, uh, in the red box is the, is the commonest. Uh, and these are the uh, frequency shown by the size of the circles of different tumor types in children. So the leukemias are, uh, are marginally more common than brain tumors. Brain and spinal tumors are the commonest solid tumor. However, when you look at causes of death, uh, brain tumours are the single commonest uh, uh, tumour-related cause of death uh, in children. That shift in the demographic is simply because of the uh, excellent outcomes for children with leukaemia. But that sort of only captures half of the problem. And this is a, a slide that I borrowed from one of the uh, funding bodies. But I kind of like it because it makes this dichotomy very clear. So on the left hand side, you've got the appalling prognosis um, for a proportion of children with brain tumours uh, and an acceptably high um, uh, rate of mortality associated with that, that. On the right, you've got an illustration of what happens to the survivors. So two thirds of those children will have lifelong, life altering disability. And bear in mind, all these children are being diagnosed under 10. So lifelong is a lot of decades uh, of potential disability. And just to illustrate that, I share a little bit of data um, that uh, my neurosurgical colleagues uh, reported from Great Ormond Street. It's not just illustrative, there are other large studies to show this. So this is the outcome from one of the commonest malignant brain tumours in children, medulloblastoma. Uh, and I'm going to show a few Kaplan Meyer plots. I've got survival on the uh, y-axis and time from diagnosis. And it's worth as I move around this, because I'm going to talk about chronicity looking at the scale on this. But essentially, you're looking at a five-year survival around 60%. So you've got that 40% of children that are, that are unsalvageable. The overall, this is slightly historical data. The figures are slightly better now, but they're still around 70 to 80%. But this is then looking at what happened to the survivors in their long term follow up. So this is looking at what their schooling is like. So the figures in um, in brackets are the percentage. So only 32 percent of the children were in normal school without uh, any educational support, whereas half the children were either in normal school with a special educational needs statement 
or we're in a school um, uh, for children with learning disabilities. So a significant impact on their education. And it doesn't really matter what domain you look at, there is significant disability going forward in this patient group. So this is showing hearing, and you've got 42% uh, almost of the children requiring hearing aids after treatment. Now, the reason why that's so critical to us as pathologists is what treatment those children get obviously depends very critically on what we've uh, said about the diagnosis and how we've stratified them. And so essentially diagnosis for us is about balancing that cure versus long-term disability. Underestimate the aggressiveness of the tumour and the child's going to die, overestimate it, and they're going to get excessive treatment uh, that will lead to that long-term disability. And the treatment is so critical in this age group because you're talking about doing surgery uh, on the developing brain, you're talking about giving radiotherapy to, to the developing brain, uh, and really aggressive treatments that affect those those long-term outcomes and this to some extent is what i think is really interesting about working in this in this area but there are quite a few challenges around doing that and i show this as an illustration so this is showing again the kind of small round blue cell tumors the embryonal tumors that we see and on the left is medulloblastoma which is the commonest and then there's what used to be called cnsp net or cns embryonal tumor of, of the, of the non-medulloblastoma type small round blue cell tumors. And this is showing how these have been reclassified using molecular techniques. And you can see on the left that the medulloblastomas is the commonest uh, uh, type is divided into at least um, 11 uh, molecularly defined subtypes that have different outcomes and some have very specifically different treatments. And the CNS peanut had just been decimated into these uh, uh, groups of different tumors and don't really exist as an entity anymore. But you add on to that the scale of the uh, case number. So overall in England and Wales, there's about 400 tumors in children's, uh, brain tumors in children under the age of 14, of which maybe 80 will be medulloblastoma and 20 will be CNS peanuts per year. And then you're going to split them into all these different groups. And most of these groups require molecular diagnosis. We don't have by and large, good histological surrogate markers to, to divide these up. So you're talking about a relatively rare tumor group that we've then divided into clinically meaningful groups uh, on a molecular basis. And then you distribute that across the country, and I'm sure this is true for anyone who's overseas, the same issue. So there's 21 principal treatment centers for children's tumors in the UK and Ireland. Uh, in, in the UK, there are 18 that are doing neurosurgery. This is possibly the most controversial data I ever show. It's from the uh, NHS Review of Safe and Sustainable Pediatric Neurosurgery. Um, uh, and any neurosurgeons in the audience, uh, blood pressure will be going up. But it's really just to make the point of the distribution of those cases. So this is the number of procedures done in different pediatric neurosurgery centers to essentially say it's a very skewed distribution. So across that 18 centers of really rare tumors, you're then spreading them very unevenly across the country. So from a service provision point of view, it's a, it's a real nightmare. And we're trying to address that with a, a document that's under consultation at the moment. But as you can imagine, there are huge controversies around how you address that distribution. And then you add to that that you really need to act really quickly in these cases. So there's evidence, and it's a little bit of a murky bit of literature, because obviously you can't do a controlled study of delaying treatment. Um, but that if you delay treatment, then the mortality starts to increase. So for most of the high grade tumors, there's an expectation that children will have neurosurgery, will diagnose them, will get all the molecular data, and they will start often radiotherapy within 28 days of surgery and certainly within 40 days. So this is an example from uh, the CCLG that publishes um, uh, treatment guidelines for children's tumors, uh, showing that for medulloblastoma. But that requires all that molecular data that allows you to subclass those cases. And added on to that, in several of these cases, you need a germline diagnosis as well within that time, and you need to get the germline counseling around that. And just to illustrate that point, this is uh, survival data from a subgroup of medulloblastomas, the sonic hedgehog activated ones, showing the survival if they are P53 wild type versus the survival if they're P53 mutant. So the children who are sonic hedgehog activated and P53 mutant have an appalling prognosis. So in principle, they need much more uh, escalated treatment than their wild type counterparts. But 50% of those children that are mutant in their tumor will be mutant in their germline. So they are undiagnosed or unrecognized Lefraumini patients. And then you've got the implication of what you do with that when you're giving them very aggressive chemoradiation.
And you need to do all that, have the conversations and plan everything within 28 days. So from a pathology point of view, you really need to be doing that in a week or two. And so we've been interested in looking at what the impact of molecular diagnosis is and how you implement that in, in clinical practice for this kind of patient. And I think it's worth up front defining what the end point of this is. And when we set up some of the studies I'll talk about a bit later, it was very clear that people were talking across purposes, depending on whether they were pathologists or surgeons or oncologists about what the outcome is. And I, I like to think about it in terms of kind of four things that the diagnosis is going to change. One is prognosis, which is obviously really important. It's really important to know if your child uh, has a 100% chance of surviving or is going to die, whatever happens, and that will influence where you are. A lot of the diagnostic changes we're interested in will change conventional therapy, it will change the radiotherapy regime, it will change the chemotherapy they get. Obviously, what the oncologists are very interested in is um, novel treatments and targeted therapies, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on, um, but that's going to be a minority compared to the ones where you're changing conventional therapy. And obviously, you want to identify the children that are likely to have a germline predisposition. The thing we wanted to do is a lot of the studies when we started working on this essentially were tr trials by any other name. They recruited patients in a highly selected way and then looked at what the impact of molecular diagnosis and what the yield was. And we really wanted to understand what practical difference it makes to us as pathologists if you just do it in all cases. The other thing that was sort of set up at the time was almost an opposition. There was a, a, a lectures being given where people would show an H&E versus a methylation array and say, well, which is best? And that seems to me crazy. If you've got a shiny new machine that's going to revolutionize your diagnosis, you don't replace the pathologist. You say, how much better is the pathologist? Do you have that? So the data I'm going to show you is, is value added of the molecular technique, not an oppositional comparison. And the other thing that happens a little bit in the studies is ignoring cases where there are technical failures. So a test that works brilliantly 90% of the time, but only 5% of your patients is a useless test. And so we were very keen that the denominator for the studies, and you'll see it's, the failure rate is reasonably high in some of the early data, needs to be taken account of. Because if this is going to be useful technology, it needs to impact all the children we try to use it on, not just the children in which it works. So the technology that's revolutionized uh, brain tumor diagnosis is DNA methylation profiling using arrays to look at, um, uh, currently the array looks at 850,000 um, CPG sites. And uh, data from the Heidelberg team, and this is uh, David Kappa's landmark nature paper, showed that there was a very robust way of classifying uh, brain tumors across all age groups. And the picture on the right shows the clusters of different uh, tumor types. So you've got the major medulloblastoma groups here and here. Um, and that that's reproducible, it's reproducible at recurrence, and it works quite nicely on paraffin tissue. And they've developed an algorithm that you can take your DNA methylation data and it will tell you um, which of these tumors or which tumors are in the classifier that it most looks like. So as you can't diagnose something it's not seen before, and it gives a statistical score out of one of how likely or how confident it is that that's the right diagnosis. So we want to look at how that was uh, implemented for children's tumors. And this is um, just to give you an idea of the data that we had. And we want to do that, as I said, in a real world environment. When we analyzed the data, we were seeing at Great Ormond Street 40 to 50% of the children's tumors uh, in the UK, or at least we estimated that against the CRUK data. And maybe two thirds to three quarters of those we were using a methylation array on at that time. So we had a reasonable chance to say, well, if you just use this on, um, you know, a large proportion of the children's tumours, how does it improve your diagnosis and what's the clinical impact? And at every stage, what we try to do is set the threshold high. We try to be intrinsically sceptical and say, well, actually, it probably doesn't add anything. You know, there's all sorts of clinical factors that are important here. So the first thing we did is we said, well, what does it add additionally? And so um, uh, Jess Pickles, who did this, reviewed the way we'd used this in the reports and said, did this technology add anything to the report that we were issuing anyway in the clinical context so the threshold's high it's not i've yeah i've said this is a an astrocytoma and the methylation rate says it's an astrocytoma it has to add some additional information and it has to be in the, it has been all the cases whether it worked or not so in this bar here that's all our cases and there's quite a high proportion in which it didn't classify i think that figure's much lower these days but that's realistically what we were getting at the time that we did that study. And then these are the cases that classified, so the score has to be over 0.9. There's some debate. Again, that's quite a high threshold. And then 
Um, the cases where there's, it simply confirmed what we already knew, cases where it refined the subtyping, cases where it amended, and then cases where it was potentially misleading or of uncertain significance. And so we estimated that if you took the original cohort, about a third of the children, it would modify the diagnosis in and above what we were doing a standard of care in a specialist pediatric center. So that's quite a high figure. But obviously the question is, how much difference does that really make to the patient? Because I can subtype tumors and give them uh, increasingly complex names, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to make any difference uh, to the children's management. So we looked at the ch cases where the diagnosis was amended or refined, and we went through it against standard protocols that exist for treating these children with one of our pediatric oncologists and said, you know, how often should this uh, change uh, the treatment plans, both against conventional treatment and current protocols and just horizon scanning a bit and saying the trials that are about to go live how often would it change uh, management so again this is a really high threshold so our expectation was probably we wouldn't get anything um, what we actually get is that it's four percent of cases it would change the conventional management and ten percent if you include experimental trials that were about to run or were in in progress at the time so that's quite high. If you're talking about one in 25 children, you're going to give different chemotherapy, different radiotherapy to. When you consider what the risks that I showed you at the beginning of the talk are, and that we we put that bar quite high for uh, changing treatment, we felt this was quite significant. We went to a position almost immediately on this of doing methylation arrays on everyone. And there was a bit of analysis about which children benefit, and actually you probably can't tell. So all cases in, in our service uh, now get a methylation array based on this data. The other question we asked with this data is, can we solve historically undiagnosable cases, but also a bit, how many cases are undiagnosable now? So we went across using the Brain UK virtual tissue bank network to go to all our colleagues across the UK and say, please send us things that don't really exist in the classification anymore, anything you were never able to solve, really nasty weird looking high grade things um, and we collected a cohort of several hundreds of these we methylation profiled them um, and uh, and then looked at what the outcome in terms of diagnosis was so the first thing to say is that specialist pathology conventional without the molecular testing solved half of those cases without us needing to resort to additional testing so there still is this really strong value of um uh, of traditional pathology and in solving that. Then we were able to solve another 17% uh, or so using a methylation array. And then we had a cohort that we weren't able to, to solve at that stage. Now, some of those are technical things. And our estimate, if you um, account for some of the factors that, that, that were more trivial, is that probably 15% of the high grade historically undiagnosable cases remain unsolvable. And I think it's a really important figure. It's a little bit dated because this is a few years old, this data, and, I, and I'll come to that in a moment. But the, being able to put a number on, these are the number of cases that actually it's just really difficult to diagnose, and it's a double-figure number. I think it's quite helpful to have that conversation with oncologists and say, actually, part of your management plan has to be around a bunch of tumours we just don't understand at this stage. And interestingly, the data from the Heidelberg team who did a similar study of CNSP notes, it works out as about 15% of the cases do not classify through their, their system. So the moment what we're doing is going through those cases, they're having, uh, they've all had panel sequencing and fusion panel sequencing um, and clustering against novel entities as they come out to see what proportion we can solve. And obviously that number is going to drop. Some of them like this uh, example is a tumor called DGONC um, that's just been adopted in the WHO accounts for some of them. And there are a number of new entities that are still appearing at a rate of knots in the field. And we'll explain it, but there will still be a finite number of cases that we don't understand at this stage. The impact of this is now methylation array is um, uh, not just our data, but obviously the, 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 the sum of data around methylation array shows that um, it has huge value in brain tumor diagnosis. It's on the national genomic test directory, but effectively for children's tumors, we can do methylation arrays panel sequencing for small variants, RNA fusion panel, the whole genome sequencing on all children's solid tumors. And we are, um, uh, certainly doing the first three tests and wherever we can getting whole genome sequencing. And that's kind of shifting how we're thinking about the diagnosis in these cases. And we're starting to look at the data from all of those different modalities in a, in a similar way. So this is a snapshot of an audit done in the department by Sarah Ahmed 
uh, who runs one of our trials, looking at the impact on diagnosis of having all those three tests. And this is across all children's tumours, not just um, brain tumours. So the yellow bit is the bit where it had no impact on diagnosis. So it's about three quarters of the cases where the molecular testing refined or altered diagnosis. Um, and then there's a group in which um, different modalities, the panel or the methylation rate together, refine the diagnosis. But really interestingly, in terms of thinking about how you triage these cases, 34% of the cases, you only, only one of the tests refine the diagnosis in a not particularly predictable way. So the methylation rate has the biggest impact, but there are significant numbers of cases where the RNA fusion panel is the only test that will modify the diagnosis. So at the moment, our policy in most tumor types, there are a few exceptions to that is we do all three. And we're in the process of analysing that over a larger cohort to see um, how that will modify diagnosis. And one of the cohorts we really want to look at is patients that have relapsed. And the reason we want to do that is that um, relapsed tumours have an appalling prognosis in children. So a relapsed childhood solid tumour ha has a very, very poor outcome. Most children in certain, certain tumour types, all those children will die in respect to the salvage therapy. And so a few years ago, we set up uh, the StratMed PEDS, Stratified Medicine for Pediatrics study. And this was a centralised study for multiomic profiling of um, children's tumours at relapse or when they became refractory to treatment. And this shows the outline of how uh, children's tumours came in and essentially they were submitted through us uh, at Great Ormond Street and through the North Thames GLH as it is now get profiling and from a diagnostic point of view that profiling includes what's actually on the test directory now but wasn't at the time of a small variant panel an RA fusion panel and a methylation array they also as an experimental part have whole exome sequencing and low copy uh, whole genome sequencing and there are a number of outcomes from this one of the major outcomes is to get children on to salvage trials and, uh, and umbrella trials. Um, but from our point of view, what we want to do is say, well, what's the diagnostic impact of having done that? The central pathology versus the central pathology plus all, each of those molecular techniques. And we've just closed to, to, to recruitment and there are 804 children in that study, which is way above the, the estimates we'd look for for recruitment. And we're starting to just clean up that data and say, well, what are going to be the techniques that really have an impact in modifying treatment for this tube? children. It's also changed the way the WHO has adopted this. So in the brain tumour classification uh, and in the new paediatric classification, which this review looks at, we move to a very much molecularly defined group. There are some controversies, particularly in North America, around some of the, the how that's been adopted. But essentially, almost every tumour type methylation rate is one of the diagnostic modality, modalities, either as an essential or desirable uh, criterion. But the other thing is, I think it's changed the way we've thought about diagnosis. So we've moved from this, which is how I was trained as a registrar, where you essentially have your morphology and you might make a diagnosis based on that and several of your cases will drop out. But you might have a hypothesis which you then need to test with immuno and that will give you a set of diagnosis. And then in a few cases, you might need genetics to test your hypothesis and refine your diagnosis, um, which makes sense. It's how the rest of clinical medicine works. But you're starting from the point of view of the most subjective test and moving to the most objective. And I think our model now very much is everyone gets certain mutation testing. Everyone gets methylation profiling. And that will solve your diagnosis in probably 90% of cases. And the role of morphology then shifts. Morphology has two roles. It sense checks this. You shouldn't be doing this without saying, actually, it makes sense in the context of what I'm seeing on, uh, uh, on the glass slide. But it also helps you with that 15% of cases where you actually can't solve the diagnosis and you need to go back to first principles and you need to balance conflicting data about what the diagnosis is. The other thing that I think it changes is how we improve and how we train. And my thinking about this is kind of comes from something that uh, Daniel Kahneman talks about around uh, psychology of expertise. And he makes this comparison that if you're in a clinical specialty where you get direct, frequent feedback on the consequence of your decisions, and his example is anesthesia, um, then your expert opinion gets better. 
If you work in a specialty, in his example, it's psychiatry, where the impact of your decisions is much further down the line, much less consistent, much less directly related to your decision. Your expert opinion is much harder to validate. And I think we've been somewhere in the middle in terms of pathology. But for the last eight years, certainly in our centre, we've been getting methylation data on every case that we diagnosed. And now for the last five years, we've been getting sequencing data on every. So you're getting a constant feedback on your diagnostic decisions. And I think that changes the way we see the H&E. A lot of the entities we talked about at the beginning that we couldn't diagnose morphologically at the beginning of this process, we probably can now because we've had that constant feedback uh, of learning that. And it's a shift as well from how we deal with those, those tricky cases because it used to be a hierarchy of esteem. You'd send it to the national expert. The national expert doesn't know what to do. He'd send it to the international expert. And it's a completely subjective hierarchy of, of how you deal with that. Um, much more now, you've got something objective to feed into that and decide how you're making those diagnostic decisions. So for the second half of my talk, I want to uh, touch on a subject that's very present in our mind at the moment, which is around the idea of brain tumors as chronic disease. And I thought I'd just show you a little bit of data that underlines this. This is really an issue around low-grade tumors. Children with low-grade tumors, and particularly low-grade gliomas, have a really stormy course over their entire childhood, and then are left in adulthood with significant disabilities, although the oncological issues with their tumors often settles down by that stage. And this is data that's really just been published by uh, one of the French groups that shows this. So they've got long-term follow-up on children that have low-grade tumors and their optic um, pathways. And so all of the data here um, is on a totally different scale. So the x-axis starts at five years and they've got follow-up to 40 years. So you're taking children through into middle age. Um, and this is the overall survival. So throughout life, and I guess we're getting up to people who are in their 40s and their 50s here, you're going to get 50% mortality rate overall. But this is their event-free survival. And it's even worse. So these children are having and then young adults and middle-aged adults are having problems for years and years and years. This is showing some of the breakdown of the kind of problems they have. Now, these are tumors that are sitting in the optic pathways and in the hypothalamus. So blindness is very common, endocrine problems. So these are various graphs showing the accumulative incidence of endocrine problems, early puberty, diabetes, insipidus, overall anterior pituitary dysfunction, cerebrovascular events, and epilepsy. So this is a disease that you don't resect completely, and then you have this completely uh, chronic, complicated, devastating disease for years. And one of the big areas around this traditionally has been around epilepsy. Epilepsy is the commonest severe chronic neurological disease of childhood. This is data from the UK from some time ago showing uh, the cumulative incidence in this purple line with increasing age uh, of a diagnosis of epilepsy. So by the time you hit adulthood, it's nearly 1% of pe people will have had a diagnosis of epilepsy. So it's very, very common. We have some data on how often there's something structural that would interest pathologists around that. So this is a study from the US in one particular state where every child got an MRI scan at a new diagnosis, or almost every child did. And then there's an estimate of how frequently um, there is something structural on their MRI scan that explains their epilepsy. So if you translate that to UK figures, you're talking about 58,000 children with epilepsy in the UK, of which nearly 10,000 will have something structural on their brain scans. And then we have a number of studies, but I think this is one of the, 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 the biggest of looking at what those structural abnormalities are. So obviously the patients with structural abnormalities proportion of those come to epilepsy surgery, and they do quite well depending on the underlying diagnosis after epilepsy surgery in terms of seizure control. So this is the European um, experience, and we contributed the UK data to this, of collecting together everyone that we could get our hands on that had epilepsy surgery and looking at what the underlying um, demographics and pathology was and i'm showing you in the pie chart the uh, children uh, data from that and essentially the biggest cause structural cause in children are malformations followed quite closely by tumors which are also the second commonest epilepsy cause in these series in in adults so tumors um and these are largely developmental tumors are a major cause of drug-resistant, early-onset, intractable epilepsy. And as you can imagine, the outcome for these children is really uh, challenging. They have many, many seizures a day, some of them. They don't respond to conventional therapy, and they're having that from very early in life 
when they're learning language, when they're getting early schooling. So the neurocognitive and psychological outcomes are also very uh, concerning. And in the textbooks, there are two broad entities. There are some rarities, but the two big groups. On the left is the dysembryoplastic neuroepithelial tumour, these pools of mucin with floating neurons in them and small round uh, oligodendrocyte-like cells around them, and the ganglia glioma uh, that has abnormal neurons. There's a binucleate neuron here in a population of glial cells. Now, in reality, 90% of the cases, well, maybe 70% of the cases you see don't look like this. They've not read the textbooks and they don't have these distinctive features. And just to illustrate this, this is um, data was published probably about 10 years ago, but I think it shows you where we've come from in terms of that problem. So this is data showing what your likely diagnosis is, DNT or ganglia glioma, if you're diagnosed at Queen Square in London, or you're diagnosed in the big reference centre in Erlangen in Germany. So in the um, uh, UK, you had a 56% chance your diagnosis would be DNET, but an 18% chance in Germany, uh, a 7.7% chance of being called a ganglia glioma in London, and a 50% chance of being called a ganglia glioma in Germany. So there are two possible hypotheses. One is that German brains are fundamentally different to uh, British brains. And depending on your politics, you might like that explanation. But what's much more likely is we've no idea what we're talking about here. And we don't know whether there are two tumour types that we can't agree on diagnostics, or there are three or four tumour types um, uh, uh, that um, we just don't recognise. So the question we wanted to ask is, how many tumour types are there, or how many common tumour types are there, and how are we best placed to diagnose those? So we collected cases, and slightly differently to some of, well, pretty most, most of the previous studies, we included the ones that we could diagnose as a DNET or as a ganglia glioma. We also included all those ones we couldn't diagnose as either or we weren't confident about. They essentially needed to be glioneuronal type tumours, um, usually with a history of epilepsy. And we got RNA data, uh, sequencing data. We got DNA data, particularly around methylation profiling, and simply said, ignore what we think these are. Well, how do they classify? And the data here shows the clustering on the left using uh, RNA sequencing on the right, showing methylation profiling. And... However you cut the statistics, there are two groups. So the answer is not that there are three groups and we can't agree how to diagnose the third, is there are two groups, but there must be overlap and we're not good at diagnosing those. So just to back that up a little bit, if you then look at some of the clinical data that matches against that, if you this is the age of onset of first seizure um, shown with the conventional histological diagnosis, and you don't see much of a difference, suggesting there isn't actually much of a biological difference in those classifications. If you classify them according to the two groups we define molecularly, the group one tumours have a very early onset seizure, whereas the group two tumours have a later onset seizure, suggesting these are biologically distinct entities. The other kind of um, correlative validation is if you look at what the driving mutations are. Now, this is a review that we wrote looking at the frequency of V600E BRAF variants, which was one of the common variants um, in these tumors, in different cohorts of ganglia glioma here, so varying between 35 and 58%, and DNETs, which vary between 0 and 51%. And the probable reason for that, I would suggest, is that these are histologically defined distinctions, and therefore they're hugely subjective, and therefore you're picking up different tumour types in the two groups. If you do the same thing with the molecularly defined subgroups, and these are just two different sequencing techniques that we had at the time, all of the BRAF mutants are in group one, and the other major mutation, which is an FGFR1 duplication, are in the group two. So they separate clinically, but they also separate on other molecular findings. If you then look at the expression data and say, well, what's different about these tumours? Um, uh, what differs hugely at the expression level is what cell types are in there. So this is gene set enrichment data from the RNA sequencing, comparing to gene sets that identify different types of brain tumours. So the, the key thing is this green curve. The further it's shifted to the left, the more that cell type is enriched in the group two tumours. And what we find is the group two tumours have a phenotype of a a progenitor for an oligodendrocyte, the myelinating cells in the central nervous system, whereas the group one tumors have an astrocytic and a neuronal uh, gene expression pattern. And we've shown that that's validated at the human histochemical level. This is an oligodendrocyte marker showing much uh, greater expression in the group two tumors. So we've recently published an expanded cohort of these cases, including 
radiological data and a validation cohort to see if this is this is robust. Um, and we've developed a machine learning model, uh, which is shown on the left from the expanded cohort versus unsupervised clustering on the right. And without going into detail of the uh, of the analysis, the two um, group solution remains uh, in the larger cohort. We we're also able to look at this with our neuroradiologists and say, can you distinguish these two uh, tumor types up front? And we give them a training set and then we give them some blind and ask them to do it. And you'll see the um, a number of features that are actually quite good at defining molecularly up front uh, on the basis of the radiology, which group these tumors are going to uh, fall into. Histology is not bad, it's not completely useless, so we then went back through and systematically looked at each of the features that are in the textbooks for these tumour types. And you can see that quite a lot of these are significantly different. Quite a lot of the things that people quote, interesting things like floating neurons, are not discriminatory. Um, but none of them really have the specificity that would allow you to uh, distinguish the two types on, on morphology. We've tried various combinations of these, and you get tied in knots where you end up saying, well, I can definitely say this case is a group one tumor or group two tumor. Um, but then you miss a whole bunch of other cases if you include that. So it's clearly inferior to the, to the molecular testing. So we think there are two broad groups. There are other distinct molecular entities, but the common epilepsy association tumors, a group one tumor that is over enriched for what was historically ganglion lining, historically still is in the WHO, versus group two that are historically overrepresented for DNets, but are not specific to those types. And that have different driver mutations and differ, different cellular phenotypes. So the last, um, story I want to tell you about that relates to the chronicity of these diseases. Perhaps addresses that question a little bit more directly. We wanted to say, well, I've told you these children have problems, certainly for the entirety of their childhood and have clinical problems for the rest of their life. And very often they have those tumours during that time because they're not fully resected. And they go through periods of growth and in some cases shrinkage, but often regrowth um, and for decades. And that's a different biological model of tumor evolution than perhaps if you're looking at what's happened in a colorectal carcinoma. And so we wanted to start to understand that. The other thing that's really critical is that it's, we're moving to a place where these children will get upfront treatment. Most of the diseases were uh, targeted treatment. Most of the diseases we're talking about are MAP kinase driven. And there's a couple of papers from uh, my colleague, Darren Hargreave, showing the benefit of um, MAP kinase inhibition uh, for these children as an upfront treatment. But the problem is then you put the child on that treatment for a period of time. Well, how long do you put them on and what happens when you take them off? And there's a subset um, of children that then rebound and see quite uh, substantial growth when you take them off their uh, MEK inhibitor. And so you may be treating children for a really extended period with a targeted MAP kinase inhibitor let alone the complications of that, you have um, an issue about how the biology of that disease changes if you're measuring that in months and years. So these are essentially chronic diseases with chronic treatments. And we don't understand how the biology changes over time. What they don't do, or at least we've not, is not well described, is take off and gain additional mutations. But what impact, what changes they do have in their tissue have on their natural course and treatment. And so we went from our archival cohort to identify cases where there had been um, multiple samples more than three months apart, with a range between six months and eight years, and molecularly profiled them in a paired manner to say what happens with uh, the passage of time in these tumors. And we started from a slightly nihilistic point of view of saying that well, there'll be nothing. And actually, there's very, very little. These are incredibly biologically stable tumors. And the only thing that we saw reliably is the story I'm going to tell you about. And I'll show you some of the controls against that. So this is a gene expression data. And actually, if you do it as a bulk gene expression, late tumor versus early tumor, you see very little. But if you do it in a paired analysis, you see a substantial um, enrichment of a number of gene pathways, particularly those around inflammation. And if you do the same kind of analysis, but you compare it to different cell types in the brain, there is one cell type that comes out reproducibly as being enriched, and that's microglia, the professional phagocytes of the brain. And this is just showing uh, the data against fetal cerebellar microglia and, and fetal eye uh, microglia.
Um, we've done that. This is gene set variant analysis. You do the same kind of analysis, but it's on a paired basis. And again, the only things that come out as being significant are enrichment of microglia in the later tumors compared to the first tumor. We then check that by using CD68 and IBA1 as macrophage microglial markers, and then um, digitally assessed uh, tumor con uh, cell content. And that's shown in different formats here. This is just showing the paired analysis, saying the vast majority increase. Those are the ones in red. Um, uh, for CD68 portion of cells and IBA portion of cells, it's actually very high frequency. You don't realize how much microglia there are in these tumors and then this is showing it as a waterfall plot because oncologists like waterfall plots showing that the vast majority of cases become enriched over time um nothing gets neuropathologists more anxious than the the issue of uh, subtyping microglia and i'm not going to get into this massively but what we've got is some data showing that these have a more anti-inflammatory phenotype the m2 phenotype so this is cd163 in a proportion of the cases showing it, it accounts for part of the enrichment and trem2 as, as, as another m2 marker so there are a few kind of caveats around that just to 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 show um the first is that from a histological point of view and from a genetic point of view, nothing happens. So this is showing copy number plots from the primary and the longitudinal based on the methylation arrays. Um, and there are no recurrent changes. On the panel sequencing, there are no recurrent changes. There are actually very few changes at all. Um, the histology doesn't change. The methylation class doesn't change. The, there are some differentiated, um, differentially methylated regions that tend to be in genes associated with the microglial phenotype, but that supports it. But basically nothing else changes. So you've got this very stable tumour over years that just acquires microglia. Some of these patients have neurofibromatosis type 1, and there's some data in the literature that NF1 gliomas have more microglia in them. So we excluded the NF1 patients, and the relationship still sticks. So this is the same data but without the NF1 uh, positive cases. And then we wanted to look at well, whether there's a treatment modified this. So one of the obvious things to look at is steroids, which patients with brain tumors are often given. Steroids don't correlate at all with uh, the data. And this is looking at whether they've had various kinds of adjuvant therapy, chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And it just slips over the significance level for radiotherapy. But I'm a bit skeptical given that overall adjuvant therapy doesn't show that and it certainly doesn't account for the entirety of the change we're seeing so there might be an impact of treatment but it doesn't account for the entirety of the change and it's pretty marginal if it's there uh, we want to look at whether age changes this is a microglial counts according to age age doesn't account for it so that's not a confounder so just to finish off thinking about what this means we've got these incredibly stable tumors with a changing tumor microenvironment and there's lots of data generally in glioma that glioma associated with microglia and macrophages have a role in driving um uh, 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 glioma uh, proliferation and invasion this is a review from david gutman on that but we also know that's specifically true in models of low-grade glioma so this is one of his models uh, of a graph driven glioma and showing that there is microglial recruitment, but that if you block that microglial recruitment by knocking out chemokine receptors, um, you no longer get the same degree of tumor growth. So there's clearly a role of these cells in driving uh, uh, tumor growth. And one last tantalizing um, bit of data, which I think is going to be really important to how we think about this going forward, comes from Till Mild's group, our collaborators in Heidelberg, who developed scores based on um, expression data of the sensitivity of different low-grade gliomas to map kinase pathway inhibition. And on in this paper, he's shown, uh, this is one of those measures on the y-axis, and on the x-axis is, is a measure of inflammatory infiltrates in the tumour, and the two things correlate very closely. So there's a potential for changing sensitivity to targeted treatment. And that's before you get to the issue of what the targeted treatment does to that population there's actually also data that till's got that one of the populations that shows quite a lot of map kinase activation is the microglial population so there's a huge amount more to understand about how that evolution of the tumor uh, affects their management um so i think that's a real summary saying we've shown that the only consistent change that doesn't seem to be driven by therapy is, a, is an enrichment of microglia over time in these tumors so I hope what I've done is given you a flavour of the really um, tricky diagnostic issues around um, uh, paediatric brain tumours, and also this idea that, that several of these are not 
classically oncological diseases, but chronic brain diseases with, with a disability that matches it. I, I just want to finish off by mentioning the people who've done, done the work. So this is Tom Stone, who did almost all of the low-grade glioma work, Syra Ahmed, who runs the SMP study and did that multiomic study, and Jess Pickles, who sat there at the back, who did the methylation analysis that I showed you at the beginning of the talk. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Tom. That was an absolutely fantastic lecture. Uh, if we were live in front of an audience, you'd hear a very loud uh, clapping from, from a, an enthusiastic audience receiving a great lecture. So thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, let me move on to the Q&A. Um, I'd like to kick off first, please. Um, one, of, one of the things I'm interested in is tumor genetic syndromes. And so I'd like to ask you about a point you made quite early on in your lecture when you talked about leaf Romani syndrome. As, a, as one of the syndromes you, you see in patients who get uh, medulloblastomas. So I was going to ask you, how, how frequent is that? And how, how much of a sentinel tumour is medulloblastoma in identifying previously undiagnosed Lefro many cases? Yeah, so I don't know. Um, uh, I, I know the, the, the statistic to back up the answer. My impression is that the P53 mutant sonic hedgehog tumours are relatively rare. We do see them, but they're not bread and butter uh, stuff. So um, whereas we are seeing medulloblastomas every every week, um, they tend to be in a slightly older teenager, young adult group, my, my understanding. Um, my impression is, and certainly the obsession around oncology, is that these children are often not recognized as being from Lee Fraumini families up front. And that would fit with my clinical experience, which is that we do see Lee Fraumini cases present that are known, but they're presenting with high-grade gliomas. The, the sonic hedgehog medlow cases are, um, to a large extent, I think, unexpected. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll move to the Q&A box next. So our first question is from James Morris, who asks, do these tumors have a microbiota? So there's some data, particularly around adult glioma, to suggest that's the case. I haven't seen quite so much data around pediatric tumors, and I think it's a kind of it's an unanswered open question. Um, but I'm not an expert on that aspect of it, so I, I'm happy to defer if that's not right. But it's not something that's predominated the literature outside a few papers around adult glioma. Okay, thank you. So next question is from Amy Bowes, who says, uh, really enjoyed your talk. For your paediatric tumours that were unsolvable by molecular testing, such as the DGONC, you showed pathology images of nuclear clusters. Are these a type of polyploid malignant cell slash giant cancer cell? And if they are, do you think polyploidy or whole genome duplication plays a significant role in disease aggressiveness, or is it just an interesting histological feature? Um, probably the latter. So. I mean, one of the things we suffer from, and I, I, I didn't want to make point this in neuropathology, is we tend to name things badly. So having that name of that disease, and in fact, I always feel when you, when you introduce me, CMPAC now is a slightly bizarre acronym. So there was a kind of focus on the nuclear clusters in the original description of that tumor type. I have to say in our cohort, they're there, but they're not a massively prominent feature. I'm sure they are. Um, yeah, presumably they are polypoid malignant cell, uh, but they're not a very common feature. If you look at the copy number changes in those tumors, they have chromosome 14 gains as a sort of recurrent feature, but they don't have other things. I don't think there's really good ploidy studies because most of that's based on methylation arrays. So it tells you relative copy number changes rather than absolute ploidy. Um, uh, but it hasn't been described that there's a ploidy change, but most of the cells are not um, multinucleate. So I wouldn't expect it on bulk analysis. Um, the interesting thing about that tumor type and why that's such an important thing is that several of the tumor groups that come out of what used to be called CNS embryonal tumors, who all got high dose therapy, do really well. And this is one of the groups that do really well. Most of the children survive. And that's having historically been treated on a whole bunch of different protocols because no one recognized it was a distinct entity. And the FOXR2 at neuroblastomas are another group that historically have been treated as gliomas, as peanuts, as all sorts of different protocols but they all pretty much do well irrespective of that treatment group. So I very much doubt that nuclear clusters would be a prognostic feature in those tumours because there's very few poor outcomes. Okay, if I could ask a quick follow-up question on that. Um, are you or are any of the other research groups doing single cell analysis, single cell RNA-seq or single cell uh, DNA-seq for mutation studies as a way of 
dissecting that issue in, in more detail. Yeah, so there's a lot, I mean, obviously there's loads of stuff around that. I think there are two broad categories of work. There's RNA single cell sequencing, which people have done around, particularly around the developmental origin of the tumour types. And we have a project looking at looking at that. And in fact, actually we've single cell sequenced the low-grade uh, epilepsy associated tumours that I showed you the bulk RNA-seq data for. And we're just in the process of analysing that, in a, but actually it reflects very much the predictions we made on the gene set and enrichment of cell, of cell type. There is um, some really nice um, single-cell DNA analysis, and there's a really nice piece of work which is not published yet and uh, I'm sort of more peripherally involved, so I won't go through the detail, from Sam Bajati looking at post-mortems uh, across both tumour and non-tumour uh, tissue from children's brain tumours to look at how the different uh, genetic changes evolve, both in the field, but also in the tumour itself. So we hope that will be published very shortly, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that if that's okay. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. It's, it's good, good to hear such studies are in the pipeline. Yeah. Okay, so moving on to the next question from Graham Murray, who says, many thanks for an excellent talk. What role could there be for AI in refining CNS tumour diagnosis, especially for the, quotes, undiagnosable cases? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess there's, there's a sort of conventional answer, and there's my kind of prejudice on this. So the, the conventional answer would be, in a sense, the methylation profiling is, is a kind of machine learning. It's a very sort of crude kind of kind of AI. So that's what we're doing already in some senses. I guess the broader issue, particularly around using digital pathology um, to, to do that, do those diagnoses, um, there's definitely data. We Part of our collaboration with the Germans is that there are a number of groups that have set up um, AI models that predict genomic analysis from um, H&E diagnosis matched to the kind of classification we've, we've talked about. I guess the issue is a little bit where that fits in. I think your comment about undiagnosable case is a really interesting one because maybe we can't classify those cases based on their molecular, but maybe in an unstructured, uh, unsupervised uh, analysis of their histology, they do actually fall out in separate groups. And I don't know if anyone's really uh, addressed that. Um, in a resource you know, rich environment, um, like Western Europe or North America, I've always felt slightly skeptical because I'm just going to do a methylation array. And in fact, actually, the drive is towards much more rapid um, uh, molecular testing. Um, several groups, and we're setting this up in North Thames, a uh, uh, building on the work that was in Nature Medicine using nanopore to get interoperative methylation arrays. And if you can get it within a couple of hours, and actually the full set of data within 24 hours, I didn't really need the AI on the histology as a surrogate for the methylation rate, which is the primary thing I want. And so our thinking around AI is what will it give us that is not part of that? Can it tell us something about tumor and microenvironment that might affect um, uh, you know, immunotherapies? Are there things around the histology that are still relevant? And there are things that, that are definitely stratifying that are histological that are actually really quite hard to answer by just looking down the down down the microscope and the other group in which it's kind of interesting and i think the the health economics of this is a bit odd and i don't really i wouldn't profess any expertise but it's always struck me as a bit interesting curious is what happens in resource poor countries and there's a number of papers published describing people doing essentially digital pathology from sub-saharan africa to a western european center and if you've got a if you've got an ai model that allow you to print the methylation class on an h and e that was taken in a in a resource poor environment that would be potentially quite powerful the reason i think it's slightly odd is that if you you've got to put the resource in the capital in to get some degree of digital pathology the costing around methylation arrays i think it's been slightly over um overstated you know our referral practice traditionally we would get as i'm sure many of the people who have referral practice 30 or 40 slides almost none of which were going to answer the question but with the immunos that we were allowed to do with a covering letter saying please don't do any molecular testing without me checking with my service manager and you've got a full economic cost of this case that's probably 500 to a thousand pounds already spent and they won't spend 400 quid on a methylation rate which would answer the question so i think there's a whole debate to have around the health economics for this and that's before you said actually if i get it wrong and this child then gets radiotherapy and are disabled for the next 40 years 
which is obviously a difficult prediction to make, but that's the stakes you're playing in. Yeah. I think to actually a really nice health economic study where you say, you know, this is by the standards of neurosurgery and neuroradiology, this is a really cheap test, which is really powerful and affects a lot of the children that you, you do. But there's definitely a lot of interest in using digital path-based AI to circumvent that in countries that don't have the capital investments set it up. Thank you. That, 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 that's a really interesting answer. Thank you. If I could finish off with one last question, if I may. Uh, can I take you to the one of the later sections of your lecture when you were talking about the low-grade gliomas and the pathological changes over time? Mm. You were focusing on the increase in microglia. So I'd like to ask you, what, what do you think are the mechanisms that are driving that, both in the sporadic cases and, and in the NF1 cases? Why, why, what do you think is the, the driving mechanism there? So we don't know. There's some experimental data that, that might point at it. There are two kind of phenomena I think are worth thinking about. One is there is microglial recruitment that is driven by the MAP kinase pathway. So it might just be an accumulative thing over time of how long you've had overactivation of that pathway. Uh, and so that's some of David Gutman's data that I was kind of alluding to briefly in that slide shows that if you drive um, BRAF expression in uh, neural stem cells, you recruit microglia. Um, the, the other thing that happens in these tumors, there's a huge amount of interest around is what happens with senescence. And, um, you know, a lot of these low-grade gliomas have a really interesting senescence phenotype. And, Part of that's a, a, secret, um, a, SAS, a, a senescent associated secretory phenotype that recruits cells into the tumor. And um, as you know, in other tumor types, some of those recruited microglia are actually really critical, macrophages rather, are really critical in driving tumor genesis and the response. And so one of the interesting questions will be whether that's part of what happens. And one of the things I'd really like to answer is actually, I and mean, we can't answer it with the studies we've got, is what happens over the lifetime course of this, because we've looked over you know, several years, but in truth, these children will have them into adulthood. And you know, some of the oncological issues become anecdotally much less potent in adulthood. So maybe the senescence pathways. Um, and one of the studies that people have talked about would be really interesting. I showed you what the mortality rate was like in adult survivors, but actually there's very little autopsy data saying, well, actually, if you look at someone, you know, my age who survived a pediatric low-grade glioma, what does the tumor look like when it's no longer an oncological issue? And what's happened to the biology of those cell populations in there? And we, and we don't know that, but I think, I think those are the two big things I would be thinking about. Okay, that's fantastic. Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much for that answer. So we have a tradition of finishing on time by 10 o'clock and it, it's just one or two minutes before 10. So I think it's time to stop. Uh, and I'll just end by thanking Tom again for an absolutely fantastic lecture, very enjoyable lecture, very informative, he covered a lot of material, really interesting stuff, and quite a, a nice, lively, interactive Q&A session at the end. So thank you, Tom, very much indeed. We really do appreciate your time for this. Thank, thank you. you. My pleasure. Thanks, everybody. That's all for today. Thank you. Bye.